move thing. I've actually been associated with move since I was in high school back in 1993. Moses and I went to move conferences together. And so uh, when I was a youth pastor, though, uh, had this little girl in my youth group named Julie, loved going to move. She was the only Christian in her family. Her junior year, uh, she convinced her younger sister to come with us, which was awesome. And so she's, she's going to come along with us. And Julie, like most young ladies that age, 16, 17 years old, uh, sometimes could have an attitude. Girls, where are you at? You ever have an attitude? Uh, you're... Your attitude is far different than a boy's attitude. A boy's attitude, you can just smack them upside the head and they're going to look, oh, okay. You know, girls that y'all roll your eyes, don't you? Wherever you've got an attitude. You slam doors when you, when you get an attitude. Now, gentlemen, quit judging the girls around here. Y'all are like pointing at people. That's mean. Okay. Julie, at home, didn't always get along with her mom and her dad. It was usually minor little stuff. Her dad was a very stoic man, didn't go to church, wasn't a Christian. Uh, but one day he had enough and she mouthed off to her mom and stomped up the stairs and slammed the door. And parents, they, they get this like, well, okay, what can I do to get what I want out of my child? And so sometimes they take things away from you, your phone, they ground you, you know, whatever. With this, her dad said, Julie, you are not going to, your, you're not going to that church thing. She's like, what church thing? Move. You're not going. And she's like, no, 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 no. No, I have to go to, like, she loved it. I mean, can you, can you imagine that? And it, his word was final. Like I said, he was just very stoic. He was a quiet man. And so when he said no, it was no. And so she showed up to church, and she's telling me about this, and she even apologized, trying, you know, like, I'll do whatever I can. I'm so sorry. Nothing was working. I called. Dad said no, absolutely not. Sister still came with us, but I mean, she was there even at the last minute, like dropping her sister off, begging that she could go home and get some stuff and get on the bus. The answer, no. Can you imagine not having this week? Can you imagine if your parents did that and just said, forget it, not at all? No, and, and I get it from the parent side. You need, you need some leverage. Like, yeah, but I was like, man, that was pretty extreme. She could have used this nevertheless theme of all of my years being associated with CIY, and I mean this sincerely, this is my absolute 100% favorite theme that they've had in all the years that I've, that I've done stuff with them. I love the nevertheless theme. I mean, just a recap of the week. You, we are undeserving. Nevertheless, Jesus is for us. And he's over us because he's holy and he is love and Jesus is in us and changes how we think and how we live. And Jesus is connecting to the lost and hurting and connecting us to one another. I mean, these are huge, big topics and it's just, it's dynamic and Julie could have used that. You definitely have grown from that. I was backstage hearing all the claps and the cheers and everything for people making decisions and I got to ask you, have you changed this week? Have you changed? <laughs> you can't actually know that yet. You can't, because it's easy to change here at Move, isn't it? It's, it's easy to live for Jesus, to be talking about Jesus, to be praying with people, to opening up your Bibles, having quiet time, listening to messages attentively, worshiping with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like it's actually kind of easy in this environment whenever you're surrounded with a bunch of people doing the same thing. We get a little taste of what heaven will be like at a MOVE conference, and it's fantastic. But to know whether you've changed or not requires you to go home to the place that hasn't been changing while you're here. I believe you that when you're saying, like, I've made decisions to change and I want to be different and I've got to do this and I've got to do that and, and all of the stuff that you've probably talked about with your youth group or small group or wherever it is, but I'm telling you the evil one is perfectly fine giving you one week of move as long as he knows that he can have you for the other 51 weeks whenever you go home. Does this make sense? And so he's perfectly fine with everything that's been going on here as long as he can make sure that you have not changed whenever you go back home. But God is sending you back with new fervor and new purpose. But what exactly is that purpose of why he's sending you home? 
That's where the change will come in, is whenever we figure out and we align ourselves with what God has intended for us whenever we go home. And I want to look back at our Galatians uh, 2.20 verse. That has been an awesome theme verse here, right? I, I want to I look at that again, and I actually want to just kind of walk backwards through that verse, just taking two points from that verse to help you prepare for whenever you go home. And so you know the verse that says, I am crucified with Christ And I no longer live. Nevertheless, Christ lives in me. And here's the part that I want to talk about here for a second. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You notice that's past tense there, that he loved me and gave himself up for me? Didn't, doesn't Jesus love us, like present tense? Well, sure. So what in the world is Paul talking about here? Like there, maybe there's reason why he's using past tense. But let, let's just think through it this way. When Peter, when Peter was uh, following Jesus, Jesus' ministry here on earth, it was approximately like three years, and Peter's following him every step of the way. In the Gospels, Peter messed up a lot. Wouldn't you agree? Didn't Peter mess up a lot? I mean, if you don't know your Bible all that well, I'll just love give you the snapshot of it. One, he argued with the other disciples all the time. He didn't wash Jesus' feet, as Anne was talking about yesterday. Like, he should have done that, but he didn't wash Jesus' feet. He walked on water, sure, but didn't he start to drown in that water that he was walking on because he lost faith, took his eyes off of Jesus? For crying out loud, Jesus called Peter Satan. If there's anything I don't want Jesus to ever say to me, I don't want him to confuse me for Satan. How about you? Like that, that just seems like bad news whenever he's saying things like, get behind me, Satan. He denied Jesus three times. Uh, he, w- there, there's, a, there's a scene in the garden when Jesus is being arrested that he cuts a guy's ear off. I think he even messed that up. Who aims for an ear? I think he was aiming for that soldier's head and he missed. Like he couldn't even swing a sword right. He wasn't getting anything right when he's following Jesus here. And after he denies him three times, he thought that he was a sinful failure. He thought that he was on the equivalent level as what Judas had done. No question about it, like he had messed up. And so when you get to the very last chapter of the Gospel of John, you could turn there if you want to or just write down John chapter 21. It's the last chapter there and Jesus has resurrected and is now going to go and reestablish things with Peter. Like he's going to get things straight with Peter. And so uh, he's on the bank, Peter sees him and and he swims in the water up to Jesus and then they have this conversation because since the resurrection, he's seen Jesus a couple of times but he's never called him back to discipleship. That's the reason why Jesus, or why Peter was fishing. He went back fishing because he thought this discipleship thing is done. I tried it. I messed it up. I blew it big time. And so I'm done. I'm going to go back to my old career. I'm not called to follow Jesus any more. I'm not called to that discipleship purpose any longer. And Jesus has news for him. And he goes and he asks him three questions and just to summarize it, he just keeps asking him over and over again, do you love me? Do you love me? Well, if you love me, then I need you to do something. I need you to feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Look at the last time he asked him that. A third time he said to him, Simon, that's Peter's name, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Of course I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue between him and Peter. It's the heart of the issue of his love for Peter and his purpose for Peter. He wanted to make sure that Peter knew that he loved him. I mean, if you're asking somebody over and over and over again, do you love me? That's, in, that's giving you an indication that the person that's doing the asking loves you very, very intensely. And so he keeps asking him over and over again because Peter needs to know Jesus loves him. That no matter how much he's messed up, he's still in the fold. He's still part of the flock. As a matter of fact, he needs to go and lead and feed the flock. And so by telling him that he loved him and then following up that up with feed my sheep, that is the indication that he is loved and that he has purpose. Peter needed to hear that he was never the less, he is always the more. 
And you need to hear that as well. That's our theme, nevertheless, right? You are nevertheless. You are always the more. As a child of God, you are nevertheless. You will always be the more. You can live for Jesus today and this week, and you could live for Jesus the other 51 weeks that are going to be following this one until you come back here next year because you are nevertheless, you are always the more. Christ died for you. There is no more roller coaster faith based on your feelings. Well, today I'm feeling really, really spiritual, so I'm really, really close with God. Oh, but to then I sinned, and so now I'm going to hell over here. But then I helped a little old lady go across the street, so now I'm doing good again because I've made these good works here. That is not the way that our faith works at all. There is no roller coaster faith based on your feelings. It's the facts of what Jesus did on the cross that establishes our faith, not how we feel in the moment at all. Our job... Our job is not to move backwards like Peter and go fishing again and start back up at his old career. It is continuing to move forward in faith because it's not about us being good enough. It's about us staying pointed in the right direction, following Jesus. Like I said, Galatians 2.20 is in the past tense. It's Jesus who loved me and gave himself up for me. God took a decisive moment in history to put his love on full display. There was a prophecy about this when Jesus died on the cross. That was hundreds of years earlier in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Isaiah 53, verse 5. If you're going to write down anything, I would write down that verse and look at it. And it says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed or bruised for our iniquities. What's a transgression? What in the world is an iniquity? Well, a transgression is when we sin outwardly. We've got something that's stirring in our heart, and then we actually sin. We're thinking about how much we don't like somebody, then then we gossip about them. That gossip is a transgression because it's coming out of us. And then it says that he was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquities are inward things that we have. We all know that we've got garbage, we've got sin and junk in here that doesn't manifest itself out through our mouth or our actions or where we go. Those are iniquities. They're still sins to God. And look at what it says here. He was pierced for our transgressions. So our outward sin that we commit, he was pierced for it outwardly on the outside in order to redeem us from that outward sin that we do. And then it says that he was crushed or bruised on the inside for our iniquities, for the things that we do inwardly. Jesus takes care of our sins inside and out, backwards and forwards, past tense, present tense and future sins he covers every single bit of it and God wants to continue to pour more and more and more love into you so that you know that you are never the less that you are always the more and you are always worth it on the cross that's what he wants you to know today and you stay pointed in the right direction because of that and I know talking in a group this big, and I don't know where you are, left, right, front, or up in the balcony, wherever you might be, I know that there is somebody that is here that is saying to themselves, but Bob, you don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the stuff that I've done on the outside and that I keep doing over and over and over again, and, and I commit myself to never doing this sin again, and yet here it creeps back in all the time, or you don't know what's going on in my heart either or in my mind that I am just too sinful, I'm too dirty, I'm too hypocritical, I'm too weak, I've messed up over and over again, I doubt I will ever get things right. You see, whenever you say things like that, whenever you start doubting yourself, what you're doing actually is not doubting yourself, you're doubting the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. Because what you're saying is, is that this person has sinned, but not too much, and Jesus' blood can cover him. And she's sinned over here, but God still loves her, and God's blood can cover her. But for me, I've sinned so much and so greatly that the blood of Jesus Christ is not powerful enough to cover over me. That is a lie straight from the pits of hell that needs to be eradicated from your life, buried on this campus, and it does not go home with you. That is just wrong. You cannot carry that back with you. He was pierced for your transgressions and bruised, crushed for your iniquities. I know, I know this feeling. I know what it feels like to let Jesus down. Can I tell you that you cannot let Jesus down because you are not the one that's holding him up. He is holding you up. And that's why he loves you. 
your purpose, your purpose in life is really to go home and to be loved by Jesus. To live out that, knowing that he loved you and gave himself up for you. How cliche for a CIY speaker to come up here and say things like, Jesus loves you. No, what I'm saying is is Jesus loved you to do what he did. And just because something is cliche doesn't mean that you don't need to hear it today. We all need to hear that today. Just like with Peter, he's looking straight at you saying, I love you. Do you love me back? That yes, and you stay pointed in the right direction, even if it hurts when he's asking you that, even if it's after a big mess up, and you're saying, but Lord, you know I love you. He's helping you get back on track to go, to go feed his sheep, to go do whatever he has called you to do because you are nevertheless in the eyes of God. You are covered all the more by the blood of Jesus Christ, making you holy and perfect. Whoa, I'm not holy. I'm not perfect. Yes, you most certainly are. Not by anything that you have done, but by everything that he has done and he has chosen to cover you making you holy and perfect. And not only are you nevertheless when it comes for, for, with the love of God that he has for you, in addition, you are nevertheless when it comes to God's plan and purpose for your life. Now, let's just get some real talk here. How many of you sometimes are just confused at what God wants you to do with your life? Whether that's in the macro, like in the big time, like what am I supposed to do with the rest of my life and my career and things like that, or even just sometimes in the moment, like God, what do you want me to do? Wouldn't it be great if God gave us this floodlight so that we could see like a year or five years or 10 years down the road and we could just see exactly like what I'm supposed to do in high school and exactly what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go to college, what am I supposed to major in, what kind of ministries am I supposed to be involved with at my church or overseas or whatever and, and, and you know like who am I going to marry and where are we going to live and what kind of house are we going to have, how many dogs are we going to have and he just gave you a big floodlight so you could see five, ten years down the road so that we could just keep in step perfectly with what he wants but God doesn't do that. It, it seems like he gives us a flashlight so that we can just keep putting one foot in front of the other. Y'all ever, y- y- have y'all seen the Move t-shirt uh, with the disco ball on it? And it says, keeping in step with the spirit. Yeah, that's based on Galatians 2.25 where it tells us to keep in step with the spirit. And it's this idea that it's the Lord's spirit that's leading us and he's got a flashlight and we got to just put one foot in front of the other, keeping in step with him, trusting that he has our future mapped out. Trusting that he's got our plans and our purposes. We just have to stay pointed in the right direction, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. A great example of this is when you contrast the Peter of the Gospels that was messing up all the time, and then all of a sudden we get to the Peter that's in the book of Acts, and it's like this whole new different person that's there. He couldn't stand with Jesus at Jesus' trial, and he's denying him there at the trial, but then you turn to Acts chapter 2, and he's preaching to thousands about Christ being crucified, or Acts chapter 3, where he's healing a blind man, or Acts chapter 10. The reason why you and I are sitting here today, that we could be here, is because of Acts chapter 10, because Peter kept in step with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit led him to the first non-Jew to come to Jesus. Up until that point, it was all Jews that were following Jesus, and he went to the first Gentile, and he was obedient, and he went cross-culture. Every Jew there thought he was just being, it was just nuts. You would never, ever go to one of those people, but he did, and he led Cornelius to Christ, and he baptized him in the faith, and it says in Acts chapter 4 that when the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day, they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The only thing that they had in favor for them wasn't their high education. It wasn't their smarts. It wasn't any of that. They had just simply been with Jesus. I need to know, are people going to be astonished at you when you go back home that you have been with Jesus this week? And they're going to go, what in the world happened to him? What is going on with her? And just like Jesus, they'll do one of two things with you. They will either love you and they will follow you and you'll get to lead them to Jesus or they will reject you and and persecute you for it. Either way, either way, it's a win for you. I just need people to be astonished that you've been with Jesus. 
Peter was finally the rock that Jesus always knew that he would become. And what was the difference? What was the difference with him? Was it the John 21 encounter where Jesus is saying, do you love me? Feed my sheep? Yes, probably. That was definitely made a difference. Was it the Holy Spirit that came down on them in Acts chapter 2 so that he had this power to preach in this way? Absolutely. I would not disagree with that at all. But also, I think Peter is just taking Galatians 2.20 seriously. That he recognized that he was crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. Because when you go home to everything that's back home that hasn't changed and you just get right back into your old routines, good, bad, or otherwise, and people can't see that you've been with Jesus here, was this week worth it then? Or was it a waste of money and a waste of time? What's going to be the difference Because your flesh, when you go home, is going to want to start grabbing everything up in your arms. All of the old stuff that you did and all of your technology and all of this and all of that. And and you're going to just start grabbing up because you want personal satisfaction and personal achievement and personal recognition and social acceptances and personal glory. And you want to live life to the fullest. But we know that grabbing onto all of that stuff is meaningless. and, And you have to just ask yourself, Paul wrote down, I've been crucified with Christ. If you are going to be crucified with Christ, that means you have to open up your arms as well and let go of some of that stuff so that God has something to work with within you. But if you're only focused on me, myself, and I, then you're going to be back here next year going, well, what happened? There was nothing that was different. Move didn't work for me. Well, quit treating move like, he's, like it's your drug dealer. Jesus is not your drug dealer to where you just show up at camp to camp or conference to conference so that you could get high and then go back down to your normal life until you need to get high again. That's not the purpose of CIY at all. It's meant to motivate you and encourage you so that you can live out your faith and be crucified with Christ 52 weeks out of the year. Jesus has called us to be crucified, to empty our vessel, our lives, so that the things that are distracting us and pulling us away, that they die so that we could be resurrected with him. We all want the resurrection of Jesus, but you have to die to self and then be raised up with him. Surrendering control. Surrendering your control to Jesus and saying, okay, my purpose is to do whatever you want, Lord. We want him to keep telling us, like, well, if you would just tell me what to do, that I would do it. I don't know if that's the case. I don't think that's the case. Why don't you just say, I'll surrender control and I'll do my part by giving control over to you. You do your part and you lead me and I will follow and he'll just lead you step by step with the Holy Spirit. I wish that there was more to it than that. But surrendering control is not about what you're giving up. It's about who you're giving it to. Somebody who knows you better than you know yourself. That, that he knows your strengths and your weaknesses and he's going to use every single bit of who you are. And as you, do, as, you real, as you do this, you will realize that you are not the less, but you're all the more. That you have more love for hurting people, more joy in life, more purpose in ministry, more kingdom work, more sin that's kicked to the gutter, more reconciliation with friends or family, that you're never the less, you're always the more in Christ. Can't you see that? That he's got so much more than what you can hold in your arms when you just open him up and you're crucified with Christ. And then you say, I put my purpose, my trust in your purpose for me. Now you remember a while back. You remember I've said a couple of times, like, yes, you've changed here. But the proof is in the pudding of whenever you go home. Well, when we rolled back from our MOVE conference with that youth group, that Julie was not with us. Oh, she was mad. Because you know what it's like, those of you that are MOVE veterans here, you know what it's like whenever you go home. You all got inside jokes because of things that happened in the dorms. Uh, Some of you have been driving our security team crazy because you're out later than what you should be. Yeah, you know who you are. Okay, don't. (laughs) I saw one guy, yeah, that's me. Thanks for recognizing me. Yes, you're welcome, I think, kind of. But you've got those inside jokes and, you know, you get to talk about, oh, we, we worshiped this song and we loved it. You get to talk about this, the amazing experiences. That's exactly what my youth group was doing. And the whole time, Julie is just getting more and more upset. She didn't show up to youth group that, pat, that next Wednesday whenever we were doing testimonies and things that, that were going on. She was just bitter and mad. And she was bitter and mad at her dad. Okay, I get that. But then she was kind of taking it out on other people in the youth group. So I finally just said to her, I was like, Julie you got to chill out. You've got to do something different. 
I, what, are, what are you going to do? Because you can't just stay mad at everybody, and, and you missed out on things, and I'm so, so sorry about that, but it's starting to affect you to the point that you're becoming bitter, and that bitterness is just going to eat you up from the inside out, and you don't want that. And she goes, well, I'll think about it, and she's still just bitter and mad. Here's what she came up with then. I said, okay, I'll check on you next week. And so within a week, here's what she comes up with. Her dad worked in a factory, got up at 4.30, some, some awful time in the morning to, to go to work, and he'd pack up a lunch, and, and he'd go to work, and he'd work hard, and then he'd come home, and he'd fall asleep in the chair just like a lot of dads do. So what she decided to do was she went down to the dollar store, and she got a, a pack of, of notes, and she, every day she decided to pack up her dad's lunch the night before and put a, just put a note in there. And so she's writing out this note. Sometimes it was just, Dad, I love you. Thank you for working so hard for this family. I'm so thankful for the things that we're able to have because of what you do. And she'd stick that note in his lunch and she'd pack it up for him uh, the night before. Sometimes it was so sorry. I didn't mean to, you know, argue with my sister or, or I'm sorry I didn't take out the trash like mom asked me to. You know, whatever it was, sometimes it was an apology. She said it was a very humbling process doing that because she didn't want to have to write apology notes constantly. And so she just had to change some things about the way that she was acting at home. You know what her dad did with that? Nothing couple months go by she gets zero response she says to me I think I'm going to quit doing that I was like it's you it was your idea if you want to quit quit but if you're asking my opinion what's it hurting he's not telling you to stop and so just keep loving him that way just keep being consistent until he says something to you just keep writing the notes and so she did for a couple more weeks there and then she gets sick uh, and it was a different kind of sickness, a, a sickness that they didn't understand exactly what was going on with her, uh, that she was hospitalized. Fortunately, it, was, it, was, it ended up being like mono, like it was nothing. But they were starting to throw around the words while she was in the hospital for a few days, words like leukemia, testing, we're, we're, we're te you know, doing biopsies, we're, we're testing, you know, and so all of this stuff is going on, uh, you know, it, with her. And this is the first time that she hadn't been writing those notes. And then uh, just a week later, guess who's sitting in church? Her dad, what are you doing here? That's a horrible question to ask somebody when they're sitting in church, by the way, but I did ask him that. Like, what are you? And he says, this week is the, you know, and she had some recovery time and didn't pack his lunch or write her notes. And he's like, man, this past week is the first time I haven't gotten one of those notes in my, in my lunchbox. I was so afraid that I was either going to lose my daughter or she was going to have a, a horrible uphill battle to fa you know, and like, he's just talking to me about that. And long story short, and guess who months later is in the baptistry with her dad, dunking him down, pulling him back up. Maybe God's purpose for your life. Yeah, that's cool. Maybe God's purpose for your life is not worrying about what is God doing and where is he leading. Maybe your purpose in life should not be worrying about how somebody back home is going to respond. Maybe your purpose in life is just keep consistently doing the right thing in the name of Jesus Christ. Just when, it, whoever God puts in front of you, because she was bitter at her dad, and she could have used a message like what Ann gave last night, most definitely could have used that, to where when Ann is saying things like, if they have pulse and skin, then you need to love them. If they have pulse in the skin, then you need to love them. And you have people at home who need to know from you, they need to know from your lips and from your actions that they are nevertheless in the eyes of God, but they are always going to be the more in the eyes of God. And that starts with the people that you came here with. It starts with the people back home that live under the same roof as you or that go to the same school with you. And if they have pulse in the skin and God is putting them in front of you, they are nevertheless, they are always the more. And I need you to know that the evil one, while he wants your other 51 weeks out of the year, you are nevertheless, you are always the more. And so go live that way.